Well, good evening, everybody. I want to teach you a new little chorus tonight. If some of you, it's new. Stand together with me. We're going to sing God's Wonderful People. And uh, if you don't know it, it's real easy. I'm just going to sing it for you, and we're going to learn the words together. I love the thrill that I feel. Sing it. And I love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God. So we'll sing that again. I love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God, what a sight, what a sight just to see all the hat. Praising God, praising God in a heavenly place is what a thrill that I feel when I get together with God. Sing that again. I love the thrill. And I love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. What a sight, what a sight just to see all the happy faces praising God in a heavenly place. It's what a thrill that I feel when I get to get. Let's do it one more time, all right? I love the thrill. Sing it with me. And I love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. I love so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain and cleansed by His blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. For I part One more time with me now. And I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain and cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we try. sing something old that's new tonight to start the service and you're singing well let's pray together heavenly father what a wonderful day it's been we thank you this morning for what we heard from dr freeman and lord how it blessed our hearts and lord tonight i ask you once again to uh, to open your word to us and to speak to our hearts through your holy spirit lord i pray that you would meet with us while we're here and we'll thank you for it in jesus name amen you're singing so well let's not stop turn in your hymn book to number 441 let's sing together sunlight hymn number 441 and let's sing it on that first verse together i wandered in the shades of night to jesus came to me and when the sunlight of his love did all my darkness flee sunlight sunlight in my soul today sunlight, verse together though clouds may gather in the sky and billows round me roll however dark the world may be i've sunlight in my soul sunlight sunlight in my soul today sunlight sunlight all along the way since the savior found me took sing that last verse together soon i shall see him as he is the light that came to me he 
behold the brightness of his face throughout eternity. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin, I have had the sunlight of his love within. Well, that is wonderful singing tonight. You may be seated. Good evening, everyone. And I echo what Brother Stephen said. Didn't we have a wonderful time this morning with Dr. Freeman? Wow. Uh, so, much, uh, so much good Bible exposition this morning from a Messianic Jew. And it's just, uh, it's just a blessing when you hear some of God's chosen people that have found Jesus as their Messiah. And then they, they began to share some things from their particular perspective there. And we're glad that uh, we could have Dr. Freeman with us. Uh, I appreciate people that have helped to, to facilitate this this weekend. Uh, Sister Darla had a wonderful meal so that we could, uh, could get him fed back to the airport. I appreciate uh, Brother Eric doing the airport duties, uh, picking him up at the airport, bringing him in, and then getting him back to the airport this afternoon. And Dr. Freeman made a sacrifice to be here because he and his wife had their grandchildren in their home. And so he came to be with us, and then he wanted to hurry back so that he could spend some time with the grandchildren while they were, they were still there. But uh, I appreciate that. And Brother Jeremy getting picked up this morning to, uh, to bring Dr. Freeman here from the hotel. And, and everybody that, that had a part, thank you so much for, for what you did there. Uh, let's remember, please, that uh, inside the little pockets in the, the back of the seats there, hopefully they're still scattered around, we've got some Connect cards. And if you notice a guest that comes in, maybe somebody that, that doesn't look familiar, would you kindly just say, hey, we've got a Connect card. Would you mind filling that out? Put that in the offering plate for us. Uh, we had a family uh, of multi-members this morning that somebody made sure they got a Connect card, and the ushers put it on my desk. And we want to be in contact with them this week because we want them to come back to Bible Baptist. And that's how we, we find out about emails and phone numbers and addresses and so forth. And we can make contacts and encourage people to continue to come to worship the Lord with us. But, but just take notice of those things there. And if you see somebody that looks like maybe they're, maybe they're not someone that's, that's a regular here, uh, just ask them, would you mind filling out a Connect card for us and drop that in the offering plate and let us have a record of your visit. Uh, remember the ladies have a special meeting coming up a week from Thursday evening. There's a sign-up list for this in the foyer. And I understand it's a finger food meeting, so please be prepared to bring some finger food for that for the ladies' meeting. If you have read your Bible through, we're going to mention this one more time today, if you've read your Bible through in the past year or read either the New Testament, the Old Testament, or done your, your Bible reading daily, we want to put your name on a plaque. And so there's a sign-up list on the uh, foyer desk uh, just beneath the mirror out there. Please sign that because we want to get the plaque made and be sure that we recognize folks who have been uh, faithful Bible readers during the past year. And that is, uh, that's something that we've done every year for the past 47 years. And uh, we, we want to be sure that we recognize our Bible readers there. There are also new schedules out on the desk in the foyer. These are free as long as they last. This will help you to, to uh, plan your way through your Bible reading for the year. It's got a good plan there whether you're going to read the entire Bible or read just the Old Testament or just the New Testament, whatever. There's a good plan there, so please take advantage of that. And uh, let's use those. We're talking about in prayer requests this morning, how many folks that we've got that are in, in need of special prayer. And uh, so many. And let's be sure that we check on them this week. Let's pray for our folks. Uh, continue to pray for Brother Bill Chancey. You know, uh, some of us think if, if we could eat all this holiday food and just wouldn't gain weight, well, that'd be a, that'd be a wonderful thing. But lo and behold, Brother Bill just can't gain weight no matter what he does. And his, his body's working against him in that regard. So we want to continue to pray for him. And our good friend, Brother Roger Foster, he and Judy were members here for many years. They moved to Alabama. Brother Roger had knee replacement surgery this past week. And we want to pray for Brother Roger's recovery. 
And if you get a chance, give him a call on the phone. That would do Brother Roger good there. He would love to hear uh, from the folks here at Bible Baptist. We've got a note here that says, Brother Greg, Erlene, and I were very happy to celebrate a joyous Christmas with our family. All of our kids and grandkids joined us here, and, and the world now has returned to normal. We trust that all the Bible Baptist family enjoyed the Christmas uh, worship opportunities too. We're still amazed at your generosity as a people. The Christmas gift that you sent was a surprise to us and a blessing. Thank you. We love you, David and Erlene Livingston. And of course, here with the, the beginning of the new year, they're transitioning from the Word of Life ministry that they conducted so many years. And so we'll, we'll stop the regular monthly support with David and Erlene there. And uh, hopefully we can pick up another missionary here and it will take their place in our, our monthly support. But David and Erlene have been precious friends and we are thankful for all they've done to help us with our Word of Life ministry through the years. All right, Brother Stephen. Turn to number 542. Let's stand and sing, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Number 542. Let's sing it together on the first verse. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take Him at His word Just to rest upon His promise Just to know the same trust in Jesus just to trust his cleansing blood just in simple faith to plunge me beneath the healing cleansing blood Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I proved him more and more Jesus Jesus around you while the boys and girls move the kids choir tonight. trust the precious Jesus Savior friend and I'm so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus Savior friend and I know that thou art with me wilt be with me to the end Jesus Jesus how I trust him Good singing tonight. You may be seated. Ushers, would you come to receive our tithes and offerings while they're coming? Do need to remind you, uh, Miss Eliza told me that uh, the boys and girls uh, are going to uh, February Fantastic. Boy, they have got a day planned on Saturday, February the 10th, and uh, they're going to leave here. I don't know what time in the morning. Do you know yet? Probably about 7 o'clock in the morning, and they're going to be gone all day. They're going to play Tower Wars. They're going to a trampoline park. They're I mean, all kinds of things all day long. Uh, with Word of Life, and uh, they're going to have a blast. The cost is $25. Be sure to make a check to the church if you're going to make a check, and you give that to Miss Eliza down here. Miss Eliza, wave your hand. You can see her. But uh, boys and girls, be sure to um, get that taken care of, or moms and dads, be sure to get that taken care of. And uh, the night before that, on Friday night, February the 9th, the youth group's going to have a game night over at the Alfords. 
And uh, I think they got a cotton candy machine and a snow cone machine and a ski ball table and a uh, foosball. We're going to have a great time uh, for the youth group that night. And uh, that doesn't cost anything. So we're going to have a good time for the teenagers and the middle and high school students on the night. And so, uh, oh, wait, Brother Wayne said it would be $100 a person. Is that what he said? That's what he He's, oh, he said he was leaving that night. All right. Well, we'll just leave the mess when we get back. We'll leave it. I'm kidding, Brother Wayne. Uh, they've opened their home to us. We'll have a great time that night for all the middle and high school students. A lot of good things coming up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight, and then the ushers will receive our tithes and offerings. Brother Dwayne Hogshead, would you lead us to the Lord? Every day I wake to find that God's been faithful in all the things I knew that he would be. And I don't know how some people live without him because I know what Jesus means to me. I can trust him, I can trust him, for my God's at work in all things that I need. He is able and unchanging, he 
Praise the hope that still surrounds me faithfully. I can trust him. I have walked into a room so full of sorrow. Seen the desperate faces in the crowd. And they looked at me through eyes so full of pity. But through joyous faith, I sang these words out loud. I can trust Him. I can trust Him. For my God's at work in all things that I need. He is able and unchanging. He's the hope that still surrounds me faithfully. I can trust Him. No storm He cannot weather, no sin He can't undo, no sickness He can't conquer, no mountain He trust him I can trust him thank you sister Kelly for an excellent reminder that we can trust the Lord great Great message in that song there. And thank you to Sister Stacy for the, the flute number this evening. I, I thought that was a blessing also. Please open with me in your Bible to the book of Genesis chapter number 6. Genesis chapter number 6. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. We're glad tonight for all of our guests who've come to worship the Lord with us. We want you to feel a warm welcome here at Bible Baptist. Genesis chapter number 6, verse number 1. I promised you this morning that... We would begin a series this evening on nuggets from Noah. Uh, Brother Bill's already told me he didn't even eat lunch today. He was thinking about nuggets at church tonight, so a little, little bit different type of nuggets here. But Genesis chapter 6, verse number 1, if you found your place in your Bible. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let's pray this evening. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, we pray tonight that the Holy Spirit would open our minds and our hearts to receive the treasures that you have for us in your word. I ask, Lord, that you would help us to bring forth things tonight that would be a blessing so that the people of God would be edified. So if there be one lost, either in the service or listening on the live stream, that they would be drawn to the Lord Jesus to receive him as their personal Savior. 
And Lord, I ask you tonight for the unction of the Holy Spirit now to preach your word in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this past week I did what many of you do every year, the first week of January. I began my journey through the Bible again. Uh, I don't know exactly how many times I've read the Bible through. I know the 47 years I've been the pastor, I've read the Bible through just in devotions. I've read it through at least 47 times that way. And, and then the just selected readings and so forth. I have no idea how many times I've read the Bible through. But this past week I started in the book of Genesis once again. And when I got to Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8, I began to, to notice things that, you know, we talked about before, things that I hadn't really paid attention to exactly that way before. And I took out my notebook. I, I was, was interested this past week. I love the ministry of Dr. Adrian Rogers. And Dr. Adrian Rogers was talking about how we need to make notes, whether you make notes in your margin of your Bible or you have a notebook, whatever. And he said, the weakest lid is mightier than the strongest memory. And I thought, boy, that's, that's true with me. I need to write it down or I'll surely forget it. But I told Judy, I, I began to write some things down in the notebook and, and see some things, and I looked at them as just being like nuggets. And I, I copied these things down, and I thought, I need to share that with the church family. But you notice here in Genesis chapter number 6, the Bible introduces us to uh, God's servant Noah. The name, if you, don't, if you don't already have this in your study notes, if you've got a... a Scofield Bible or, or Thompson Chain, whatever kind of Bible there. If you don't have this mentioned by the name Noah, you might want to jot this down. The name Noah appropriately means rest. And God's servant Noah is mentioned here. He's introduced to us in chapter number 6. And the name Noah, we're going to find out, is repeated 47 times throughout the Bible. 39 times in the Old Testament, the Bible refers to Noah by his name. Eight times in the New Testament, the scripture refers to Noah by his name. And the scripture gives us some wonderful descriptions concerning Noah. For instance, you notice down in chapter 6 and verse number 9, the Bible refers to him as a just man and a perfect man. It says these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. The word just if we were to put this in, in more modern usage English here, the word just means that he was a morally pure man. He was an upright man. He was an honest man. And so Noah was a just man and, notice the next word, and perfect. Uh, now, it's not saying that he was without sin. Notice it says perfect in his generations. That is, when he's compared to other men of his time. It's not saying that he was a sinless and only the Lord Jesus lived without sin. But it tells us here of Noah that he was a perfect man. He was a complete man. He was a man, the, the word means he was full of integrity. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it speaks here of, of him as uh, being a, a man that was uh, full of integrity. Uh, that was his nature. That was, that was his character as far as his behavior was concerned. Uh, the Bible goes on and tells us, for instance, in chapter 6, verse number 22, that Noah was faithful to do all that God commanded him to do. I wish that I could say that about myself. I can't say that about myself. But Noah was faithful to do all that God commanded him to do. Chapter 6, verse 22 tells us, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. So did he. What a wonderful testimony. In chapter 7, verse number 1, we're told that God viewed him as being righteous. And then by way of a side note, if we had time tonight, and we don't, but if we had time to go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 14, verses 14 and 20, Ezekiel 14, 14 and 20 identify Noah to us as being a righteous man of the same caliber with Job and Daniel. And they're two of the heroes of the Bible. And so the scripture likens Noah to these individuals. In the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 5, calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. Perhaps one of the most eloquent recommendations of Noah to us is that God included him in Hebrews chapter 11 in God's hall of fame for men and women of faith. 
And of course, the event that is most identified in Scripture with Noah is the worldwide flood that God sent during his lifetime of 950 years. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 9, verse number 29, that the flood began when Noah was 600 years of age. You notice we read in the Scripture a few moments ago in chapter 6, verse number 3, God said in the middle of the verse there, uh, yet his days, man's days, shall be 120 years. And so it's letting us know here that Noah took 120 years to build the ark. He followed God's instructions. He constructed the ark. And then when he was 600 years of age, the scripture says that the rains began to come, the foundations of the deep were broken up, and that God sent a flood upon the earth. And so while I read, I, I began to, to write down some things about Noah's life, his lifetime, his ministry, things that I'd never just particularly noted before. And I, I thought a good name for these is Nuggets. And so everybody here is familiar with, with Nuggets, chicken Nuggets. And we mentioned this morning, you know, when you go to get the Nuggets, you don't get the full, the full leg. I, I, I still go back to my childhood. My favorite part of the chicken is the leg. And if I, if I have my choice, I'll eat the chicken leg. Uh, Judy, uh, I asked Judy, we were leaving the church here uh, Thursday afternoon, and I said, what would you like to do for supper tonight? And she said, well, let's go down to this restaurant at Social Circle here, and they have chicken wings. And so we went down, and we, uh, we devoured a dozen chicken wings, lemon pepper, love them, love them there. Uh, but the leg is still my favorite part. Uh, but you notice the, the nuggets. You can go to Chick-fil-A, you go to McDonald's, you go to places like that, and you, you get that. I thought, well, let me look up the word nugget in the dictionary. Exactly what does it mean here? And, and I was disappointed because the dictionary said it simply meant a lump. <laughs> and I, I thought about, well, when I go through the line at Chick-fil-A or go through the line at McDonald's, I don't want to tell them, give me a lump of those. But uh, according to the dictionary, that's, that's what it means there. But, but I, found some, I found some nuggets, some meaty portions in Genesis chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter number 8. And they were a blessing to me. And, and I, I believe that the Lord would use them to bless all of our hearts. And here's one. I'm just going to share one of them with you this evening. Here's a, here's a nugget that I gathered from the, the, the study of Noah. And that is sin does have consequences. Sin does have consequences. You and I are living in a time that many mock the idea that sin or misbehavior has consequences. Uh, we, we see it played out sadly on the news broadcast when criminals are brought before a court and they're given perhaps for, for a serious crime, given at most a slap on the wrist or probation. And they're never, they're never brought to face consequences for their misdeeds. Uh, whether it is going into a store and, and looting that store, whether it's, it's going to a, a four-way stop and jumping in someone's automobile, uh, taking the driver out, throwing them on the street, and, and stealing someone's car. And we, we see it played out so often. We, we hear it in, uh, in schools when school students who have misbehaved badly sometimes have almost no consequences, if any, for that behavior. Uh, you and I see some parents parent that way. They parent so that there are no consequences. I mean serious consequences for misbehavior. And folks, in our society, when we see this, we need to recognize that Satan is trying to blind us to this particular truth. In the sight of God, there will be consequences for sin. And the Bible, the Bible refers to, to this over and over. Back in chapter 6, verse 5, we read this, where that God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And verse 7 says, God said there's consequences. Verse 7, the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing, the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me. God said it's made me grieve over this. I'm sorry that I have made and God's word says that there are consequences for sin. You look down in verse number 11, the Bible says, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. 
And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, look at this, the end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And God's reminding us here of, of this, this nugget of truth here that there will come in the sight of God and the plan of God and the work of God, there will come consequences for sin. Have you ever thought about the number of words that the Bible uses to describe what sin is? Let's go on a quick journey. Go with me to the New Testament book of Romans, please, chapter number 3. And everyone in the building tonight can quote Romans chapter 3 and verse number 23. Everybody here tonight knows this verse, Romans chapter 3, verse number 23. But have you really analyzed what God is telling us here? Romans chapter 3 and verse number 23, the scripture says this, For all have, and I underlined it here, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The word sin, I, I took out the, the concordance there and I thought, well, what word is what word is used here in the original writings in the Greek writing of the New Testament? And I found out the apostle Paul used the Greek word there, hamartima. Hamartima. And if you begin to, to search the meaning of this word, hamartina means literally to miss the mark. You say, what mark is it talking about? To miss the mark of God's perfect standard. It's to miss God's benchmark. It is to miss God's requirements. God's standard is perfect righteousness, complete holiness, absolute obedience to His commandments. And the scripture says that all of us, it's not just some of us, but all of us, Hamartima, all of us have sinned. We've all missed the mark of the perfection that God requires of His creation. I told you many times through the years when I was a student at Bob Jones University, uh, my, uh, all, it was an awful thing. I was a freshman, dumb as a rock. I didn't realize when I signed up for phys ed at 8 o'clock in the morning and I was going to take archery, that was going to have to be outdoors. And folks, I'm going to tell you, at the foothills there in October and November and early December, and you're out there with that little, that little BJU t-shirt and those little shorts, you'll freeze yourself to death. And I was taking archery. And it was cold, it was so cold. And they had targets that were way off in the distance there. And so the instructor had given us good instruction. He told us how to, to position the arrow and the bow and so forth. Folks, I was shaking so badly. And it's, it's, it's like that, that fellow that, that went, went hunting one time with his grandpa, and his, his grandpa uh, had, had the shakes there. And they said, well, there's a, there's a squirrel up in the tree. Shoot him, grandpa. And so grandpa takes his gun and he does that. And he pulled the trigger, and he shot, hit squirrel, hit the limbs on the tree. It was an awful catastrophe there. And somebody said something to his grandson about it. He said, he said well, Grandpa should have hit it. He aimed all over the tree. <laughs> but I missed, folks, I didn't miss the bullseye. I shot arrows and literally missed the target. I completely missed the mark. It brings us back to this word hamartima. The scripture said all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now there's another word. Would you go with me in your Bible over to the book of Hebrews for a moment. Chapter number 2 and look at verse number 2 in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2. The scripture said, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression... And disobedience received a just recompense of reward for the sake of time. We'll stop right there. But you might underscore the word transgression. If every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. The Greek word there is the word parabasis. Parabasis. The word parabasis means to overstep a boundary. It means to overstep a forbidden line. God has drawn a line in the sand, so to speak. And God said, on this side, here's right. On the other side, there's wrong. 
And the scripture is talking here about violating that boundary, uh, crossing that forbidden line, going beyond the authorized place or position that God has set. The scripture says that's where we stand with God. That's why we need a Savior. But that's not the only two that he used. Go with me even closer to the back of the Bible, if you would, please. The book of 1 John. Would you look with me at 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 4? 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 4. Interestingly, the translator of the King James Version of the Bible uses the same English word as was used in Hebrews 2.2, 2, but it's not the same Greek word that renders that. If you found your place there in the book of 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 4, the Bible says this, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. You find that that mentioned there twice, transgresseth or transgression. That is the Greek word anomia. Although it is translated into our English word, the same one in Hebrews 2.2, 2, it does not come from the same Greek word. It's anonomia. The word anonomia means a breach. It means a violation. It means an offense. It means wrongdoing. And so these are three words that the Bible gives us to describe sin. Here are three words that God uses to communicate us the, the meaning, what it is when we fail to live to God's standard. The scripture offers several testimonies of sin's nature. This was an interesting study to me. For instance, in the book of Psalms, Psalm number 140 and verse number 3, the Bible likens sin to a poisonous viper, like a, a rattlesnake, like a, like a king cobra. The Bible, like, because God wants us to understand the gravity of sin, the danger of sin, he gives us that testimony. He said sin is like a poisonous viper to the life of the sinner. And Daniel chapter 7, verse number 5 Daniel likened sin to the, the cruelty of a bear. In Joel chapter 2 and verse number 25, the scripture likened sin to being destructive like a canker worm. Sin destroys lives. Listen, nobody's life has ever been improved because they've gone into sin. Nobody's ever had a better life because they chose sin over righteousness. In Proverbs 26 and verse number 11, the scripture likens sin to an unclean wild dog. In Luke chapter 13, verse number 32, the, the Bible likens sin to the cunning of a fox. In John chapter 10 and verse number 12, the scripture likens sin to the fierceness of a wolf. In Psalm 22 and verse number 13, the scripture likens sin to the devouring of the king of the beast, the lion. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 22, the Bible likens sin to the filth of the swine. And so God gives us all of these testimonies here concerning sin because God says we're going to be accountable for sin. God says there comes a reckoning day for sin. God says there comes a time when the, when the books are totaled up and the debt must be paid. The Bible also warns of the high cost or the high consequences of sin. In John chapter 3, Jesus was preaching, and in verse number 18, Jesus said one of the consequences of sin is condemnation. In Genesis 26, in verse number 10, the scripture says one of the high cost or consequences of sin is guilt, guiltiness. In Ephesians 2, in verse number 12, Paul said one of the one part of the high cost or consequences of sin is the 
experience of hopelessness because apart from Christ, there's no hope of getting past the consequence of sin. In the book of Luke chapter 15, verse 24, and Luke chapter 19, verse number 10, the Bible speaks about the high cost, the high consequence of sin as being lost. This, to, me, to, to me, the word lost is the saddest word in the Bible. The scripture says the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. I took out the dictionary and I thought, what, what all meanings do we have there, the word lost? Uh, the scripture says without Christ we are lost in our sin. It means to be parted with. There's no fellowship. It means to be wasted, to be ruined. It means to be no longer known or used. That's a part of the high cause, the high consequence of sin. And then, of course, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the Scripture speaks of the fact that the high cost of sin, the uh, consequence of sin, includes spiritual death. It's, it's been observed many times. Uh, I hear Mark Trammell's quartet sing the song, I, I've listened over and over again. That somebody put it to the words of a gospel song. Uh, somebody's wisely, wisely, uh, wisely observed that sin will take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. The Bible talks to us about the high cost, the consequences of sin. And when God relates to us in his word the record of Noah, the Bible is reminding us that there are indeed consequences for sin. There are consequences for living outside of the revealed and perfect will of God. But that brings us to a, to a last thing. God has made a divine pr provision. Look with me back there just before we close tonight in Genesis chapter number 6. There's a word in verse number 8. There's a word in verse number 8 that we ought not miss. Genesis 6 and verse number 8, God's word tells us this, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You see, Noah was a sinner just like everyone else on earth was a sinner. But Noah was not content to say, I'm going to have to face the consequences, uh, the, the high cost of my sin. And Noah sought God, and God had grace to extend to Noah because God was not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Noah hearkened to the voice of God and the message of God's grace. And God said, I'm going to have a provision, Noah, so that you don't have to perish. And God gave Noah the instructions concerning the ark. Now, I feel certain tonight that everybody here understands that the ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. The ark was literal. I mean, this, this, is, this is not a fairy tale. This, this worldwide flood, the building ark, this is not a fairy tale. It's not, a, it's not one of the uh, uh, stories somebody just handed down. Well, this really didn't happen. No, it was literal. But the ark was also used by God. God made it to us something we could understand. God used an illustration. The ark is a picture of Jesus Christ. If you've never noted this, I, I hope that you will. The ark represented Jesus' provision of salvation by way of the cross. You remember the ark was God's idea, not man's idea. And we see that in Genesis chapter number 6 and verse number 14. God said, make thee an ark. And God, God told him what it was to be like. Make thee an ark. The ark was God's idea. And it reminds us of the book of the Revelation chapter number 13 and verse number 8. Romans chapter 13 verse number 8 where we find out that salvation in Jesus Christ was God's idea. It was not man's idea. The scripture said, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose name is not written in the book of life. The lamb is talking about the Antichrist there last day so forth. But it, it says about Jesus, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
In other words, it tells us that when God created the earth, when God laid the foundation of the earth, God already had the plan of salvation in mind. God had already planned salvation before he created the the world. God knew that that man was going to fall to sin. Man was going to rebel against the, the perfect righteousness of God. God already knew that. But God in his grace, that the riches of God... God had already planned that Jesus Christ be our Savior. God had already planned to send His Son to the cross. God had already planned to to send His Son to the cross and the grave and then to raise Him from the dead. God, God already had all of this planned out. But the ark that represented Jesus Christ's provision of salvation was God's idea. And then also the ark that represented Jesus' provision of salvation by way of the cross was a complete shelter for God's coming judgment. The ark was, it was the complete salvation. It wasn't that that Moses had to to hang on to a peg on the side. It wasn't that, that, that any of that, no, once a person entered the ark, the scripture says, God closed the door. And it's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a picture there how that God provided everything for our salvation that was needed in Jesus Christ. Folks, salvation is not a matter of us trusting Jesus and then adding our good works to what Jesus has already done. Paul's already told us in Ephesians 2, we're saved by grace through faith and it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. The scripture also tells us that the ark that represented Jesus' provision of salvation was entered by choice as God extended an invitation. In Genesis chapter 7, verse number 1, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. God gave an invitation and anyone was free to come. And folks, that's what Jesus did for us on the cross. Jesus paid our sin debt in full on the cross. He rose again from the dead the third day. And now God gives the great invitation. And he says, come unto me, all ye that labor heavy laden, I will give you rest. The scripture closes in Revelation twenty two seventeen. 17. This says, him that is a thirst, let him come. Drink the water of life freely. And just like Noah responded to God's invitation by entering the ark, if you're, a, if you're a Christian tonight, if you're a believer, it's because one day you heard an invitation and Jesus said, come to me. Come to me and be saved. The ark that represented Jesus and his provision of salvation, you notice had only one entrance. Genesis chapter 6, verse number 16. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit thou shalt finish it above. And the door, notice it's singular, it's not plural. The door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. Many of you have been to uh, Ken Ham's place. I would would encourage every Christian family to visit the ark in Calvary. I would would encourage every Christian to visit it. But I remember when Judy and I were taking the tour of the ark there, you, you come to the place on the inside where there's the door. And they have lighted there the form of a cross. Of course, that's where most people get their picture made. That's where we had our picture made inside the ark there. But we're reminded that the ark had only one entrance, and that's a reminder that salvation has only one entrance, and that's Jesus. In John chapter 10 and verse number 9, Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And so the ark is, again, it's a picture. It's something that happened literally. It's, some, it's not figurative. It's something that, that actually happened there. But God so worked in it that man could see a picture of his son, Jesus Christ, in the ark and how the ark provided salvation when, when folks would accept the invitation and folks would enter that door. It's a picture of what happens when we come to Christ and we're saved from our sin. The ark that represented Jesus Christ's provision of salvation was a provision into which no one was born. Did you ever think about that? Notice in Genesis chapter 8 and verse number 18, and Noah went forth and his sons, this is talking about after the flood was over and after the, the ground was dried, Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. You notice there were no children born on the ark. And that's a reminder that, folks, if we're going to heaven, we've got to understand we're not born saved. 
we're talking this morning with, with Dr. Freeman here. Everyone who goes to heaven goes because you make a personal decision to receive Christ as your Savior. When I was an 11-year-old boy, I had a choice. I had heard the gospel, but the preacher said, but would you do something about it? You see, I had it all up here, but I didn't have him right here. And I said, Lord Jesus, I do receive you. I do receive what you did for me on the cross and the empty tomb. Lord Jesus, I receive you now as my Savior. And it's a reminder to us when we look at the ark, the ark that, that God called Noah to here. It's a reminder that, we're, that no one was born in the ark just like nobody's born saved. We have to make that decision to trust Christ as our Savior. The ark that represented Jesus Christ's provision of salvation also was a... Ooh. It was a secure place. Not a single soul that entered the ark was lost. Nobody fell overboard. Nobody got washed out. Everybody that entered in was secure. When the judgment of the flood waters fell, when the foundations of the deep broke up, when the, the, the water raised that ark and the ark's floating about there, nobody was lost. And when the judgment was passed, God said, come on out. And everybody that entered in came out alive. And folks, listen, if you're a Christian tonight, the devil may have played games with your mind. If you, if you have genuinely trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can never, ever, ever, ever be lost again. Amen. We fail the Lord. I fail him every day. But he never fails me. Amen. He keeps me. The scripture says in John 10, verses 27 through 30, the Lord holds us in his hand, and it says no one can pluck us out of his hand. And I reminded you that the word man there is in italics, which means it's added for our understanding. But actually there, what it's saying, there is no man, there is no demon, there is no Lucifer, there is no devil, there is no one of any kind that can pluck a believer out of my hand. We're saved, saved eternally. The ark that represented the Lord Jesus' provision of salvation was singular. There was only one ark. Only one. And anybody that was going to be saved had to go into that ark. And folks, there's, there's no other salvation than in Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter number 4, verses 12, 13, the Bible tells us there, there is none other name under heaven. Listen to that. There is none other name under heaven given whereby we must be saved. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. Jesus Christ is the Savior. There's, there's, no, there's no salvation in a denomination. There is no salvation in good works. There is no sal salvation in Islam. There is no salvation in Hinduism. There is no salvation in Buddhism. There is no salvation in any of that. It's Jesus or nothing. It's Jesus or nothing. Jesus said, I am the way, John 14, 6. I am the way. He didn't say, I'm one of many. I told you many times what Dr. Hudson said. Dr. Curtis Hudson's witnessed no man one day, and he's telling him, he said, he said, it's Jesus. you got to trust Jesus to be saved. And the fellow let Dr. Hudson finish, and, and he said, well, Dr. Hudson, I want you to know, well, I don't agree with that. He said, I ain't going to heaven like going to the post office. And he said, some people came up Scott Boulevard, and some people came up Highway 78, and some people came up so And Dr. Hudson let him talk. And finally, the fellow finished his little tirade there. Dr. Hudson said, well, there's only one problem with your theology. And Dr. Hudson, he, he said, Dr. Hudson, what's that? He said, when you die, you're not going to the post office. <laughs> there's one way to heaven, and he is Jesus. And it's pictured by the ark. The ark was singular. There's only one ark. There's only one Jesus. There's only one Savior. But what an awful price the Lord Jesus paid so that we could be saved. 
What an awful prize. It cost him his lifeblood because, because he was not willing that we perish. That meant sin, there was accountability. Sin had to be paid for. There's a consequence of sin. We read it tonight. The wages of sin is death. Ezekiel 18, 4, the soul that sinned, it shall die. And the only way around that is we had to have someone who would pay the cost of sin in our place. And that's what Jesus did. 1 Peter 2, 24. He bare our sins in his body on the tree. Jesus paid sin's cost for us so that we could go free, so we could be redeemed. I read a story of something, something very sad that happened in an Indian village many years ago. A little girl had gone outside to play. The Indian village was very, very humble, very, uh, very, uh, very poor circumstance. But she had a little, little mud hut where, where she lived. The little girl went outside one day and she was going to play. And she did not notice out on that, that barren wasteland, she did not notice that a large rattlesnake had coiled right beside that little mud hut that was her home. And while she was, was playing there, the, uh, the rattlesnake focused on her, and when she got close enough, that snake reached out with all of its venom, and it sank its fangs into her leg. The little girl began to scream. Her brother was nearby, and he realized there was trouble, and he ran to assist his sister. When he came on the scene, he saw the rattlesnake. He was able to kill the rattlesnake, but seeing the, the blood come forth where the fangs had pierced her leg... This young man began to, to, he put his mouth around the, the wound there and he began to suck that poisonous venom out of her leg. And he worked and he worked. He, he sucked as hard as he could to get that poisonous venom out. What he had not thought about, however, was at that particular time, he had a large sore in his mouth. And as he sucked that poison out of his sister's leg, the poison entered his own body. Within a couple of hours, his body lay dead. His act of love resulted in the, the saving of the life of his little sister, but it cost him his own life. Folks, that is, a, that is just an illustration of what Jesus did for us. In order for us not to be put to death by the venom of sin, Jesus had to take the venom of sin for us. And folks, that's why Jesus died upon the cross. And that's what Jesus experienced on the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, that's one of the nuggets that I saw this week in Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8. There are, there are several that I want to share with you over the course of the next few Sunday evenings. Uh, but this was, this was the first one. Hey, do you know Christ is your personal Savior? Is there someone here tonight who say, I've never trusted him? You might have said, I joined the church. I, I was immersed in water. You might say, I've been, I've been a part of this committee, that committee. So that, that's not the issue. The issue is, has there been a time when you personally realized that you're a sinner because we all are? We've all sinned, but do you believe that Jesus, God's Son, died in your place on the cross? When Jesus died on the third day, God the Father raised him from the dead because God the Father said, that's all it takes. That's all it takes for folks to be saved. My son's substitutionary death, the shedding of his blood on the cross, and the scripture says that whosoever now shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Stand with me, please. Musicians, would you come? If you have never received the Lord Jesus as your Savior, will you receive him tonight? We'll sing an invitation song this evening. Invite you to come. If you tonight say, tonight I want to get this nailed down. I want to know for sure heaven is my home. If you'd come and trust Christ, let me or our brother Stephen or, or Miss Judy, someone take the Bible and just open with you and open the scripture with you and pray with you. And tonight you say, let, yes, Lord Jesus. I take you to be my Savior. Do that tonight. Father, we thank you tonight for the, the message of the gospel and the record of Noah's ark. Thank you, Lord, for giving us such a, such a powerful illustration, such a plain and clear illustration 
of how precious Jesus is to us. and What he means to us as the one who saves us from sin and from the consequence of sin. Lord, I pray if there be a man or woman, young person in the service or, or perhaps one listening on the live stream tonight who's never called upon your son and said, yes, Lord, I do take you tonight. Lord, I pray that they would accept your invitation and they would trust Christ tonight and be saved. Have your will in this invitation. Be glorified in this time. You're worthy, Lord, of all of our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you look in your songbook to 163? Let's sing together. Come every soul. After the service, you say, I'd like to, I'd like to hear some more about this. If you'll just whisper to me, Brother Greg, I want to talk to you. Speak to Brother Stephen. I want to talk to you. And you can settle the matter of eternity so that you have not emotional assurance, but you have scriptural assurance, Bible assurance of where you spend eternity. Brother Stephen, any announcements? Everything's covered. That's good. It's been a blessing to be here tonight. Such sweet fellowship the Lord's given us this evening. Let's be a witness for the Lord this week. Remember, there's somebody that needs to hear from us this week. That Jesus loves us. And he's provided a way of escape from this old world. The, the, the consequences of its sin. Let's pray together. We'll be dismissed. Brother Don Ryland, please lead us in prayer.